So if you see your countries addressing thing over there, Nihao, Konichiwa, Japanese, Ola, Spanish, Namaskaram, Salaam Alaikum to all. Howdy is like a Texan thing. <laughs> Howdy. So I welcome you all to our evidence-based lecture, a free live lecture on breaking the myths. The myths in the market, the three conditions that would I would like to discuss is the piriformis syndrome, the frozen shoulder, and your tennis elbow. Okay. I will discuss a little bit of a literature, but we will do a lot of a demonstrations of advanced manipulation and dry needling. Okay. So I will show you because the manipulations, the evidence-based manual therapy, and the dry needling can actually help your patients in a holistic way. Okay. All right. So we'll get on with the lecture. <clears throat> Just uh, clearing a few things. Uh, the lecture recordings and the certificates will definitely be given to our ISOM premium members. That's what my team communicated. And uh, the recordings will be given to the people. Actually, we are having some hands-on training as well in Delhi and Mumbai, which I will talk about in a while. So in case if you are interested in signing up for some our dry needling hands-on courses in Delhi and Mumbai in India, you're welcome to register that because Dr. Kelly Wilson, who's coming from the United States and myself, we will be doing these hands-on training. So I welcome you all. I'm Dr. Parijat Kumar, founder of International Sports and Orthopedic Manual Therapy. I'm a certified spine and a sports specialist. I'm also a certified dry needling practitioner. Okay. <clears throat> and in case if you have any questions and concerns, I'm going to type our contact information. It is there on the presentation as well. You can note that down. So I'm going to quickly uh, mention our whatsapp number you're welcome to approach our team on that particular number or you can email on the address that i'm mentioning in the chat box if you have any kind of a query okay there we go all right let's get started oops sorry too too quick so the topic of today's free live lecture is i breaking the myths okay we will be demonstrating a lot of advanced thrust manipulations or an advanced dry needling. I will be talking specifically about piriformis syndrome, frozen shoulder, tennis elbow. All right. I'm also registered from American College of Sports Medicine. I have done my training in the United States of America. I worked in the United States and currently I'm practicing in a wonderful tropical country, India. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I've done my DPT, which is a doctorate from Arizona Health Science Center, which is in Arizona, Tucson, all right? A quick note, guys, uh, the content of the presentation is obviously the legal copyright of the ISON Foundation. And when we are doing this manipulation or the dry needling, I am not expecting you all to go tomorrow to your clinic or next week and start doing manipulations and dry needling. Please don't do that. Okay, so our ISOM or myself or any staff or the faculty will not be responsible for any adverse events caused to your patients after doing this technique. This is just for the learning or education purposes. Okay, if you want to learn, you have to have an official training in manipulations and dry kneeling. That is a professional way. Okay, all right. So I'm going to start. And if somebody wants to know about our website, we have a web website called theisom.com you're welcome to go on our website we have n number of courses okay theisom.com all right somebody saying sorry my bad so the website is theisom.com you are you can approach us on the email you can follow us on the so different social media as well all right uh, people are saying there is no voice i Guys, please check your internet connection. And I hope the video is stable now. You can hear me loud and clear. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start the lecture. Sorry, there was a quick uh, 
yeah the voice is a little echoing because i'm in a training center right now i agree with you uh the, my voice is echoing a little bit i can agree with you because i'm in a training center right now i did a hands on training so please bear with me uh try to listen to what i'm saying all right okay dogs so guys i want to ask you guys i want to ask you guys what do you know about piriformis syndrome what is a piriformis syndrome i want you all to tell me in the chat box let's talk to each other what is a piriformis syndrome what is a piriformis syndrome let's talk to each other quick in the chat box what do you understand by piriformis syndrome the chat is open if somebody wants to say something i can unmute you or you can mention that in the chat box as well somebody is saying well see i get a different answers and that's why we have to educate everybody that what is a piriformis syndrome somebody is saying piriformis tightness somebody is saying piriformis hypertrophy somebody is saying piriformis compressing the sciatic nerve all right i am going to change all of your thoughts today believe me i'm going to change all of your thoughts today and that is why i said this lecture is clearing the myths because we do write a lot of times the piriformis syndrome and the sciatica yes stretching the piriformis muscle do help the pain with the buttock pain or the sciatic flossing but that is what the piriformis is syndrome is all about that your sciatic nerve is getting compressed due to your piriformis muscle okay that's what we know about the piriformis syndrome but do you know my next question is i'm going to change all your thoughts today believe me <clears throat> this is actually a misconception now do you know what is the piriformis muscle attachment can somebody tell me the piriformis muscle attachment can somebody tell me the piriformis muscle attachments because if you know the attachments you will be great in treating your piriformis syndrome what is the muscle attachment of your piriformis muscle i like that answer one person absolutely bang on specifically she answered the answer question sorry good anterior surface of the sacrum the volar surface of the sacrum from your s2 to s4 going all the way to your greater trochanter now you need to know the orientation of the muscle and i'm going to draw in my subject over here while doing the dry needling okay great yep so if you know your piriformis muscle muscle attachments you can do the dry needling or the soft tissue what whichever do you want to want okay now what is the muscle action guys tell me the muscle action of piriformis what is the muscle action of piriformis these are simple basic things that you should be knowing before i jump on to the treatment somebody is saying hip abduction you are not wrong but hip abduction is done by piriformis at a certain angle so the major or the primary function of the piriformis muscle is the external rotation absolutely correct somebody is saying adduction sorry it's not an adductor <coughs> muscle absolutely it is a external rotator of the hip what is the nerve supply guys great great answer i i see you guys are all smart you know your stuff what is the nerve supply <laughs> i know people would be saying sciatic nerve no sciatic nerve does not supply piriformis even though it can pass through it there is no nerve called piriformis nerve <laughs> femoral nerve i am getting some good funny answers guys <laughs> give me some good answers give me some good correct answers most of the people have answered it correctly good it is superior gluteal nerve the nerve root value can be l4 l5 s1 or sometimes s2 can be included as well so great 80% of you have answered it correctly so if i'm asking you a nerve supply to a mu muscle you don't say oh piriformis nerve there's no there's no nerve called piriformis nerve okay and it's not a sciatic nerve just because the sciatic passes through it sciatic nerve doesn't supply piriformis it's your superior gluteal nerve from l4 l5 s1 and sometimes s2 as well all right 
So you should be knowing the orientation. So I, I'm going to show this. This is the orientation of the muscle. If you see the piriformis attachment coming from the ventral aspect of your sacrum and going all the way to your greater tuberosity. Okay. So you need to know the, and this is on the posterior aspect. So you need to know the attachments and the orientation of your piriformis muscle. Now, if you see this slide, if you think the piriformis syndrome is the syndrome where your sciatic nerve is disturbed because of your piriformis muscle, look at this particular picture. In picture one, the sciatic nerve is going under the piriformis muscle. In picture two, B, there are two slits of sciatic nerve which is going between the muscle and under the muscle. If you see picture C, your one part or the slit of the nerve is going over the muscle belly and one is going under the muscle belly. If you see picture D, the whole nerve is going within the nerve, within the muscle. Okay. So my question to you is the patient that you are treating. I repeat, my question to you is the patient that you are treating. How do you know that sciatic nerve is passing between or above or below that muscle? I repeat, the patient that you are treating or assessing for piriformis syndrome or a patient who is having a sciatica, I mean, they can have a pseudo sciatica. Okay. They can have a pseudo sciatica. They can have a referral pain from your gluteal muscles. Okay. So, but a patient comes to you, how do you know that the patient falls in the category of B, A, C, D, E, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, you're not going to go do an MRI or ultrasound. So, well, femoral pulse is anterior. Femoral pulse is not posterior, please. Somebody is saying about the femoral pulse. We don't palpate femoral pulse posteriorly. Femoral pulse is palpated anteriorly. In order to help your sciatic nerve and piriformis muscle, I, that's why I asked you, guys, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I know you guys are running. I want you to assess the patient first. Our problem is we like to jump on the treatment, the manipulations, and the needling. Hold on. Assess the muscle first. Why is it getting hypertonic? Why is it getting painful? Why the sciatic nerve? Okay, let me talk about this. You told me the nerve supply of piriformis. Great. Tell me the nerve root value of sciatic nerve. Tell me the nerve root value of sciatic nerve. I always ask this. Without looking at the Google, without looking at any kind of a search engine, tell me the uh, root value of shutting now. Because if you know the root value of shutting now, and if you know the origin and insertion or the orientation of the muscle, you can actually treat this patient in a holistic way. The root value of the shiatic nerve is L4 to S3. I repeat, L4 to S3. Okay, so there, there are branches from L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. Tell me now, if you know your sciatic nerve is coming from three sacral segments, S1, S2, S3, how many of you are checking and treating sacrum? Raise your hand. Does it make sense? So if the sciatic nerve is coming from three sacral segments, why are we not checking and treating sacral segments? Please tell me. So, oops, sorry. So three sacral segments are there in your sciatic nerve. Please tell me if you are checking the sacral when approaching your patients with piriformis or sciatica. All right, just give me for a second.
all right guys i'm sorry about the delay no i was gone sorry yeah i was gone <coughs> so tell me when you know that there are three segments coming from the sacral spine are you checking the sacrum are you checking the pelvis talk to yourself or you are just relying on the mri reports for l4 l5 l5 disc bulges and you are waiting for the patient to bring you the mri report and okay then we start with the distraction piriform stretch the the same old pattern that we do talk to yourself are we assessing sacrum are we treating sacrum just a picture down the line i showed you the attachments of piriformis you yourself said that your piriformis is attached from the ventral aspect of the sacrum to the greater trochanter are you checking the sacrum why are we not checking the sacrum because your muscle is coming from the sacrum your sciatic nerve is coming from the sacrum so talk to yourself whether we do a manipulation or whether we do a dry needling we need to check the sacrum as well we can't be relying just on the massages the soft tissue the cupping the dry needling or just the stretch you think only the stretch will help your piriformis muscle or the sciatic nerve i'm sorry it's not okay now there is a separate entity how to check your pelvis and sacrum we might not have the time in this particular lecture to completely tell you the assessment of pelvis and sacrum all right we generally do that in our cohort manual therapy programs all right so next what you do i check for the pelvis and the sacral examination you check for pelvic rotation correct you check for pelvic rotation you check for the sacral leg joint dysfunction you check for the sacral torsion this is your sacrum it can go left it can go right it can go down back you check for the pelvic muscle strength and then you check <coughs> excuse me and then you check for some lumbar spine compensations there are researchers and the authors who say that you cannot see the lumbar spine until you correct the pelvis and the sacrum because there are a lot of compensations going on the lumbar spine if a patient comes to me with a disc bulge on lumbar spine i'm not going to pay attention to that until unless i correct and check the pelvis and the sacral leg joint If you really want to learn about the pelvis and the sacrum, we have a course on our website, thaisam.com, about the pelvis and the sacral leg joint. Okay, and if you want to really learn holistic in a holistic way, uh, you're welcome to join our manual therapy cohort program, which is one year program. All right, all right. So I'm going to show you some manipulation techniques over here. Enough of the theory. I'm going to quickly show the manipulation techniques. Faber's and Patrick test is a not very reliable test. That's why I tell telling you there are a lot of myths. Faber test can help you with the iliopsoas spasm. Faber and Patrick is the same, but yes, your old assessment books do say you can do check for the sacral leg joint dysfunction. You cannot, you can never check a joint with only one test. There are certain battery of test and static and dynamic palpation that you will have to do in order to diagnose a sacral leg joint dysfunction. All right. So, say for example, I have a subject over here who is having a sacral leg joint dysfunction. Okay. I would like to perform two manipulation techniques, and then I'm going to show you the dry needling for piriformis. Okay, so always do a battery of tests when it comes to any kind of a body region. Okay, so my patient is in a supine position right now. He is exposed and he is in the towel. So I really thank him. I'm going to show you the demonstration. <clears throat> All right. So my patient or the subject is in a supine position over here. Okay, I can check his pelvis. I can check his pelvis over there, like the static palpation. Okay, now say for example, if his sacroiliac joint is affected. Okay, I hope you can hear me all. There are two techniques that I can show you. Okay, one is the manipulation of the sacroiliac joint. So can you please turn towards me, sir? All right thank you so the patient has taken a side turn i would like to bend his upper leg straighten the lower leg sir okay straightening the lower leg locks the spine 
So he's in a side position. Okay, I'm going to show you from this, but I like to stand right in front when I'm doing the manipulation. All right. What I will do is I will ask my subject to hold on to the bed. I will show you from the top. So can you hold on to the bed, sir? So he's holding on to the bed. And can you bring this hand? And I'm going to hold this hand like so. Okay. The technique looks something like this. So I'm going, can you hold on to my wrist, sir? Thank you. So he's holding on to my wrist like so. And with the other hand, he's holding on to the bed. My thinner eminence. My thinner eminence on his posterior superior iliac spine. Okay. It is on his posterior superior iliac spine. It is where the sacroiliac joint is. I'm going to put my hand like this. I'm going to put my hand like this. And I'm going to manipulate this joint. One, two, this. Jump. Okay. So you can manipulate the sacroiliac joint in this way. Now, before you start manipulating, it is very important to assess the particular dysfunction at the pelvis. Okay. The second manipulation that I would like to show is, please come on the prone position, sir. Now here, you might need a partner, okay? And I would, this is a little difficult technique, okay? I'm going to show you this way. I would like my colleague over here to stabilize his, can you come from there? I want you to stabilize the patient's right isla. So the sacrum is there, there's sacrum. Sacrum has sacral base and isla, okay? So I'm going to manipulate his right sacral iliac joint over here and my colleague over here is going to stabilize his right isla. So the technique looks something like this. I'll show you. Okay. I'm going to take his right leg and take the right leg. He's in a prone position. So my colleague over here is stabilizing the subject's right isla, which is a part of the sacrum. I'm going to take his right hand I'm going to take his right hand, not hand, the leg, into abduction, please relax, sir, into extension and internal rotation. Internal rotation. Extension, abduction, and internal rotation. And what I'm going to do is see my position. I'm going to lean back. 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 Okay? So this is my position. My elbow is straight. I'm going to lean back. Okay? I'm going to lean back. And the patient takes a deep breath, bring it out. <laughs> I've given a high velocity, low amplitude thrust. Okay. So those are there are a lot of manipulations that you can do for your sacroiliac and pelvis joint. But seeing the time and keeping the time management, I can only show you these two manipulations for the sacroiliac joint. You can do one this. And you can do a long, this is called a long axis distraction manipulation. All right. Okay, dogs. I will show you the needling technique for piriformis muscle, which is very handy. All right. So I'm going to bring this a little closer. I would respect and request my patient or the subject to for the exposure of this area. So I'm going to lift this up gently, sir, if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Sorry. So I'm going to expose this area. Can you shift towards me, sir? A little bit. All right. You know what? Uh, can we take this down a little bit? Sorry. This is too much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to put this like this. Just relax. Just relax. That's okay. Like this. Now. So I'm going to kind of manage this area over there. Now, you see the right hip area. You see the right hip area, all right? So I'm going to make some drawing for his piriformis muscle, but make sure when you're doing the dry needling, the size of the needle matters, the angle matters because you don't want to touch the sciatic nerve. You know your sciatic nerve is passing through that area. So I'm going to first draw his piriformis muscle and sciatic nerve, and then I'm going to show you how you dry needle. Make sure you know the basics of dry needle. You have a glove, you sanitize the area, and you choose the right needle, open the 
gauge tube properly and dispose the needle properly in the sharp spin. Okay. So for him, let me check his PSI first. That is his PSI. That is his sacrum. All right. And let me now palpate his greater trochanter. Okay. If you can't feel the greater trochanter, you can ask the patient to internally and externally rotate. His greater trochanter is right over there. Right over there. I'm going to make a cross. Right over there. If you can see the cross over there, I'm going to bring the laptop a little closer. That is his greater trochanter. Okay. Now, the piriformis would be looking something like Coming from the ventral aspect of the sacrum, it would look something like this. All right, excuse me. Coming from the ventral aspect. Thank you. I'm going to show you from the top. I made the drawing. Okay, so the, the muscle you can see over here, I made it from the ventral aspect of the sacrum attaching over his GP attaching over his GP now this is a deep muscle under the gluteus maximus all right thank you okay so S2 S4 from the ventral aspect the muscle comes deep to the gluteus maximus and attaches to your greater trochanter now you have to be careful with your sciatic nerve. Your sciatic nerve is coming from your S1, S2, S3. Okay. So sciatic nerve would look something like this. I'm going to kind of a black it out so that we kind of, a, sorry, want to make a little bit of a drawing. You might have a good shower today. All right. Sorry about that. So if you can see the black line over there, I've drawn. That could be his sciatic nerve. Okay. So I want to stay away from that nerve. So if I'm needling on the medial side, I don't want to angle it towards the nerve. If I'm needling it on the lateral side, I don't want to needle it towards the medial side because I want to stay away from that nerve. So if you want to needle, you're welcome to needle directly vertical on the lateral aspect or on the medial aspect. Now I'm going to take a I'm going to take my needle, and this is a 40 mm needle, okay? I'm going to wear my gloves, okay? I have to take a proper precautions. I'm going to wear my glove on the left hand. I'm going to wear a glove. I'm going to sanitize his area where I'm going to needle. So let's say I'm going to needle his lateral aspect. Please relax, I know it's a little cold. And in case if you have a capillary puncture or bleeding, that's totally fine. So I'm going to needle his lateral aspect of the piriformis straight down. Okay. You should be knowing how to handle the needles. Okay. I'm going to take a needle off. I'm going to wrap it out. Take it out. It's a 40 mm needle. If your patient is a bulky patient, you can use a bigger needle as well. But make sure you are not touching the sciatic nerve. Again, you're not supposed to go towards the sciatic nerve, whether you're doing medially or laterally. I'm going to take the needle out from the tube, holding onto the tube and the gauge tube together. Please relax. Educate your patient. I'm going to uh, put the needle in, sir. Please try to relax. You might hear a break. You might feel a break. Okay. I'm going to put straight vertically in and I'm going to do a tap. Relax. Simple. Uh, my needle is over there. If you can see closer, my needle is over there. Please relax. There we go. I'm going to put it in. I see a twitch. I see a good twitch. Relax. Breathe. Are you okay? I see a twitch over there. If you see the needle over there, I can put the needle further in. If the patient is uncomfortable, you can take the needle out and press it a little bit. Okay? I will show you the technique again. When you're putting the needle back, always put it upside down in the gauge tube. So I put the needle upside down in the gauge tube. I would like to use, I would like to do the dry needling again. So please relax, sir. This is his lateral piriformis. It's a deep muscle. You can use a 40 mm needle or a 60 mm needle or a 70 mm needle, depending on the patient's 
uh, girth of the muscle. Okay, and please stay away from the sciatic nerve. So I'm going vertically down. Tap hard. Take it out. Okay, your tap should be good. I'm going to squeeze it in. Please relax. Twitch is coming. Twitch is coming. Relax. If your patient shouts and screams, don't worry. That's common. All right. I have to go completely in. I have to go completely in. I can see a lot of twitches over here in order to approach the piriformis muscle because it's a deep muscle. I think in his case, I can use a 60 mm needle as well. But just to be safe, I'm using a 40 mm needle because you have a big gluteus maximus bulk over there. All right. So let's see the needle position. I'm going to show you carefully. Okay. So that is the needle over there. I can move it a little bit. I can move it a little bit. So that is his piriformis muscle and that is a shattering of nerve passing. And that is the needle over there. All right. I'm going to take the needle off slowly. I'm going to press it. Because the patient might be a little uncomfortable and there's no bleeding over there. I'm going to put this in the gauge tube or I'm going to put it in a proper sharp spin box. Okay. I can use the same needle for the other areas as well. All right. So that was for the piriformis. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Now we will start with the other areas. Thank you. We have to cover the frozen shoulder and the tennis elbow as well. So here is your piriformis needling. I see a very innocent question patient asking me if there is a right side piriformis muscle problem. Yes, we do manipulate the right side extra leg joint. Why would you manipulate the other side? All right. The duration depends upon the acuteness or the chronic problem. Okay. Yes, that's why we uh, use a bigger needle because you have to go through your gluteus maximus. You are doing the needling for gluteus maximus as well because it's a superficial muscle. Okay. So that's why I use a bigger needle like a 40 or a 60 mm to pass that gluteus maximus because piriformis is a deep muscle. Absolutely. All right. Duration can be 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, five minutes or 10 minutes. You can do that. All right. So you need to know the anatomy of your piriformis, the sciatic nerve, very important, the function, the nerve supply, the referred pain to your sacroiliac joint, your trigger points. And what is the needle technique? It should not be angled towards the sciatic nerve. It should never be angled towards the sciatic nerve, okay? And should not never be done superficially. You are never going to do, you should be knowing the track of your sciatic nerve. Always do it in the, either the medial or the lateral to your sciatic nerve. If your piriformis muscle is hypertonic, you need to check the sacral alignment. You right now said that you will stretch the piriformis. If your piriformis is hypertonic, your dry needling can help quickly fix the hypertonicity of the, uh, the muscle. The angle was straight vertical down, straight vertical down. Okay. Now I know guys, you have a lot of questions regarding this. You're welcome to join for our hands-on training in order to uh, learn about the dry needling for all these muscles. Okay. I have to proceed forward because we have, uh, we have to cover frozen shoulder and tennis elbow as well. All right. So please avoid the sciatic nerve. All right. Okay, dokes. So this is an advanced dry needling the way I showed you. You can use a 40 mm needle depending on the patient size or a 100 mm needle as well. Okay. Please don't try this if you don't have any kind of official training in dry needling. Don't experiment it. Okay. And we are coming with our basic and advanced dry needling certification course, hands-on training, which will be in Delhi and Mumbai very soon. All right. The tennis elbow and the frozen shoulder. Uh, Dr. Kelly Wilson and myself, we would be doing a certified pelvic health practitioner certificate, which will be on June 1st and 2nd in Delhi and May 30th and 31st in Mumbai. So right now I'm in Mumbai. I'm doing a lot of hands-on training. So if people there are from Mumbai and they want to learn these trainings in hands-on, they're welcome to approach us. And then from June 1 to June 10th, we will be in Delhi, India. So Dr. Kelly Wilson, who was the president of Pelvic Health in American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapy, AON, which is like the topmost uh, manual therapy organization in the world, 
and we are also doing a certified dry needling practitioner hands-on course basic as well as advanced for three days in mumbai as well as in delhi this is in person okay and then we are also doing a certified extremity manipulative therapist where we are covering the shoulder elbow and basic and advanced foundation of manual therapy these are all hands-on training in person that will be done by us experts like dr kelly wilson and myself okay so these are the dates if you have any questions and concerns regarding this uh, you're welcome to approach our team <coughs> all right so you can actually become a certified pelvic health practitioner level one if you do dr kelly's pelvic health course okay now there's a small video about it if you can see First I can say <laughs> this is just an introduction she will be covering all the external and the internal examination of the pelvic floor for the pelvic health practitioner certificate All right. So people who are interested, they're welcome to join us uh, in this pelvic health or try needling hands-on courses in Delhi and Mumbai. All right. Frozen shoulder. Guys, quickly, what do we know about frozen shoulder? What do we know about the frozen shoulder? What do we know about the frozen shoulder? Quick, in the chat box. We might go a little over eight, guys. What do we know about frozen shoulder? All right. Sorry, I was just putting my laptop on the charger. What is frozen shoulder? Well, it's not the tightening of the rotator cuff. Well, you need to clear your myths, guys. Somebody says periarthritis. Well, periarthritis arthritis is an umbrella term. Tell me exactly what is frozen shoulder. Adhesive capsulitis. I like that. Uh, Tom, so how, if a patient comes to you with frozen shoulder, how would you identify that shoulder, uh, patient with the adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder? How? You don't have any MRI, you don't have any ultrasound, you don't have any findings. How will you identify this patient as adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder? Reduce range of motion where? If a patient comes to me with a reduced range of motion, this, I can't elevate my shoulder. Is, do you think that is a frozen shoulder? Not all your patients are frozen shoulder. Understand this. So if you are telling me that the capsule is inflamed and it is an adhesive capsulitis, what is the capsular pattern? Okay. I want you all to hold on. Relax your answers. I am getting like at least hundreds of answers over there. So that's great. You guys are communicating and listening to me. <laughs> I want you to tell me the capsular pattern of shoulder. And that's how I can tell my patient is a frozen shoulder. Perfect answer. One of the uh, participants has given me a perfect answer. So if you think that the patient's passive range of motion is limited in dash, dash, and dash, what will be the capsular pattern? And that's how we determine the patient to be having a uh, frozen shoulder. The flexion is not limited in the capsular pattern. 
So the mnemonic that I like to teach to all my participants is lab me. I will write it down for everybody. Lab me. Lab me is your capsular pattern, if you don't remember, which means lateral rotation restricted more than the abduction, restricted more than the medial rotation. Lab me. Remember this. That is the capsular pattern. If you see your patient's passive range of motion to be restricted in let lateral rotation, maybe it is this way or that way as compared to the abduction, as compared to the internal rotation. That is your capsular pattern. And that patient, I can say, has a frozen shoulder. Not all your patients are frozen shoulder. Please understand that. Okay? And you need to know whether this is a patient with a frozen shoulder or an impingement or a subacromial impingement or a rotator cuff tendinopathy or is it coming from the neck, back, etc. How do you approach this, treat this? You need to know about the impingement as well. There is something called impingement, subacromial impingement. There could be a secondary impingement or the primary impingement. All right. We do cover all this in our certified extremity manipulative therapist hands-on course. There could be an instability of the joint, which can lead to the impingement and restriction in your shoulder elevation. There could be a trauma. Now, the trauma or these things will not bring a frozen shoulder like this. So there's an article by Kelly et al. in 2009, which says that there are certain classical signs or symptoms for a frozen shoulder. The age can be between 40 to 65. You have a capsular pattern. It is more prevalent in, in a hormonal issues like diabetes and thyroid. Okay. And there could be a night pain and you have to have this capsular pattern for your frozen shoulder. If the patient says I'm restricted in my elevation like this and this is okay. Abduction is kind of a okay. Internal rotation is full. You cannot say that is a frozen shoulder, please. All right. Now, what are the thrust manipulations that you can do for your shoulder patients, whether it is a frozen shoulder or any kind of an impingement? I'm going to show you some neck and thoracic manipulation because if you treat the regional interdependence of your cervical spine and thoracic spine, believe me, you get beautiful results for your shoulder. All right. So I'm going to quickly show you some manipulation of the neck and thoracic and then the shoulder. Okay. So my patient or the subject is in a spine position. All right. I take his left C5, C7. I turn it to the left side. Please relax, sir. Okay. There we go. All right. That was the C5 to C7 manipulation. And believe me, when you do a neck or a thoracic manipulation, you get beautiful results for your shoulder, whether it is a frozen shoulder or your impingement. Okay. Talking about the thoracic spine, you can do it in this position. We talk all about this in our cohort manual therapy program. And we can talk about this in our extremity uh, hands-on training as well. So patient turns towards me. I like to put my lobster grip on the patient's spinous process. Turn him down like that. He is in a crook-like position like so with his knee bent. All right. Patient takes a deep breath. I perform an extension. Breathe out. Take a deep breath, sir. Breathe out. Deep breath. Don't hold your breath. There we go. All right, are you okay? We heard a pop at the T7 level. I was at the T7, T8 level. But for the shoulder, you can do it on the upper thoracic as well. I've already manipulated him on the cervical thoracic or uh, the upper thoracic. Let's do one thing. Turn on your uh, stomach. I quickly show you a uh, cervical thoracic. So I guess I have done it on the other side. So let's do it this side. I'm going to do a cervical thoracic manipulation, which really works beautifully with your shoulder patients. My hand is on his C71. The other hand is like this. All right. I'm doing a cervical thoracic manipulation. There we go. All right. I manipulated his C71 quick and there was a crisp pop. Okay. So these all techniques will really help your shoulder or the frozen shoulder patients. But the frozen shoulder is a classical adhesive capsulitis, which might take its own sweet time to recover. Okay. The next manipulation. If you don't know the manipulation, guys, you can do the mobilization. Not that I'm saying that you have to do the manipulation. You can do the uh, mobilization as well. Because of the regional interdependence, your cervical spine and thoracic spine manipulation will help the shoulder because all the nerves are coming from your cervical and thoracic spine. So I'm going to show you the posterior and the AC joint manipulation. Please, can you have a seat, sir? Okay. So I'm going to show you in this patient, 
Now, AC joint manipulation, I'm sure you guys know where is the AC joint. So that is his coracoid process. That is his coracoid process. I'm going to block his coracoid process. Your AC joint is a joint. All right, thank you. So your AC, no, 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 no. your AC joint is a joint between your clavicle, clavicle bone, and the spinal scapula. Okay, so his AC joint is right over there. I have drawn his clavicle over there, and it comes to your AC joint. I block his coracoid process. I'm going to manipulate his acromioclavicular joint. I take his arm, put it into extension, a reduction, and circumduction. I'm doing some mini thrust before I do the manipulation, extension, reduction, and circumduction. And this, my AC joint manipulation is an intermediate direction. So I take him into extension, a reduction, and pop. That is his AC joint manipulation. Now, talking about the posterior manipulation, can you tell this reason? Come back, come back. Come back, come back. Come back. Can I have a talk? All right. So what you can do is you can put a tower roll or something to block the scapula. All right. And you can block the scapula like this or males or females, you can use the barrier. Okay. And then the patient can be in a flexion position, whatever is the, is the available range. Thank you. Okay. So I can block the scapula but i will leave the shoulder open posteriorly okay so the patient is in a flexion position i take the arm into flexion i'm going to maintain a minimal body contact i'm going to put my hand on his opposite shoulder i'm using the barrier i'm not touching the patient directly all right i'm whatever is the available range you can do it over here if the available range is this you can do it over here you can do it over there i want the patient to relax I'm pushing him a little bit interior with my body to stabilize the scapula and gently feeling for the end range barrier. Gently feeling for the end range barrier. Please take a deep breath in, sir. Breathe out. Boom. Okay. That is a high velocity, low amplitude thrust for your frozen shoulder. Now, I showed you the cervical thoracic, the cervical, the thoracic manipulation the AC joint manipulation and the posterior manipulation. Believe me, there are a lot of manipulations and mobilization for the shoulder, which can holistically help your patient. All right. But because of the time, I will not be able to cover all the manipulations and the uh, dry kneeling techniques. All right. Okay, dogs. So we will demonstrate two dry kneeling techniques uh, for uh, shoulder. I will like to demonstrate supraspinatus and a very important muscle is subscapularis. Okay. So let me show you the supraspinatus muscle. The patient is in a prone position. All right, thank you. So let's do one thing. Uh, can you stand, please, sir? All right, let's put this there a little bit this way. And lay on your stomach. So I've already made the drawing over here. I'm sorry. I made the drawing over here. I'm going to show you a closer view of the scapula. Okay. I can uh, reconfirm. Give me the, the drawing over there for his scapular border. If you see his scapula over there, that is his lateral border, inferior angle, medial border, superior angle, and that is the spinal scapula. All right. If you see over here, so that is, let, let's show it from the lateral side. Thank you. So that is his scapula, all right? That is his infraspinatus, with the spine of the scapula. That is his supraspinatus over here, which is deep to your upper trapezius belly. Now that is his medial border, subscapular is, is deep interior within the scapula. Now you need your muscle anatomy very clear in order to do the dry kneeling. So I'm going to quickly do a dry needling for his supraspinatus and the subscapularis. Okay, thanks. Can I have a little please? So again, I'm going to take a 40 mm because supraspinatus muscle is deep. Okay. 
So I can wipe that out. I can wipe that out with my uh, alcohol swab. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm using a 25 mm needle for his supraspinators over there because he's a slim guy. If you can see. Okay. So that is his supraspinatus under the upper trapezius belly. I'm going to use a 25 mm needle. All right. I'm going to tear this down. My angle has to be towards the supraspinous fossa. Please relax, sir. Okay. The angle goes straight down in towards the supraspinous fossa. All right. I'm going to take a 25 mm needle. This is my needle. All right. I'm going to palpate the supraspinous fossa. Please relax, sir. I would never, requ I, I'm requesting you all, please don't try this if you don't have an official training on dry needling. You don't want to cause your patient's pneumothorax. And again, I'm saying we are not responsible for any kind of uh, injuries to your patients or anything. So initially only I told that if there is any problem, please don't try this if you don't have any official training. All right. If you want to learn from our courses, hands-on training in Delhi and Mumbai, you're welcome to come. All right. So this is the supraspinous fossa. I put the needle down and... Let me take the thing out. All right. I hold the tube and the needle together. This is my supraspinous fossa. I feel for the trigger point. I feel for the trigger point. I put the needle in and I'm going to tap it down in. Please relax. Sir. Okay. The needle is straight down there. There we go. I'm going to show you from a closer view. So that is his scapula, spine of the scapula. And that is my needle. Oops, sorry. That is my needle straight down in. If you can see, are you okay, sir? The needle is straight down here into the supraspinous fossa. Okay. I have to use a little bigger needle in order to pass his upper trapezius because upper trapezius is more superficial. And supraspinatus is deep. All right. So I'm going to take a needle out now. Please relax, sir. Thank you. And I'm going to gently press it from there. The patient might feel a little bit of a pricking pain. That's okay. That's normal. Okay. I tell them it's a filament. It's not actually a needle. It's a filament. All right. I'm going to put the needle in and I'm going to throw this in my sharp spin box. All right. So that was for the supraspinatus quickly talking about the subscapularis which is a complex muscle to use the dry needling and i am again requesting you all not to do it if you don't have an official training all right again and again angle of supraspinatus needle was straight towards the supraspinous fossa all right okay dose. i'm going to use a 40 mm needle this time for his subscapularis okay so let's so show it from this side angle this side, this side. Thank you. So if you see the, oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. Something happened, something it does, sorry. I know my, this is happening. Sorry. Sorry about, about the, Interruption, guys. Something happened with the presentation. Let me share it. Where is this one? All right, there we go. Sorry. I guess it zoomed out. Oops, why is it zooming out? All right. Okay, dokes. I hope you can see it. Yep. So I'm going to show you the needle with the medial aspect because the subscapularis is on the medial aspect. Let's not try to touch the screen. Okay, go down, go down, go down. All right. So that is his medial border of the scapula. I can ask the patient to put the hand under the belt or the pocket, like so. I can put something down here to rest. So his hand is under the pocket. He can put something here. It should not be holding up. I can put something here to rest. Okay. I can put a towel. I can put a towel roll to rest over there. Okay. What it does, if you see carefully, is going to bring the medial border of the scapula more prominent. Okay, so this is his medial border of the scapula. I'm going to use a needle, 40 mm needle, directly horizontally. I'm going to push it in because your subscapula is coming from the interior aspect. Okay, so I'm going to use a 40 mm needle for a subscapularis. Please relax, sir. 
I'm going to put the needle straight down horizontally like this. See how I'm doing it. If you want to learn more about this, you're welcome to join our courses. So I'm going to push it in. Please relax, sir. There we go. Relax. So I'm going to push the needle horizontally, horizontally like so. Relax, relax. Might be a little uncomfortable for your patient. Look at my angle of the needle. Look at the angle of my needle. It is, it is going horizontally straight down. It is going horizontally straight down. The patient elbow is supported. Patient elbow is supported. It is right in the pocket. And look at the angle of the needle. It is medial to lateral on the anterior aspect. That is the needle. That is the needle. Okay. I'm going to take this out. It was a 40 mm needle. I don't want to kind of uh, hurt him too much. Are you okay, sir? Okay, I'm sorry. Sometimes the skin irritation can be painful for the patient when you're doing the dry needling. Okay, but make sure you know what you're doing. Again, I would not expect you to do it if you don't know the needle part. All right. So supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Oh, sorry, supraspinatus and subscapularis we covered. Similarly, you can do the muscles of the scapula around your infraspinatus, series minor, rhomboids on the major side. But please don't cause a pneumothorax and have a proper training in the dry needling when you do it, okay? You can also do like a capsular needling, needling if your patient is a frozen shoulder, but capsule needling and subscapularis needling, they all are quite advanced, okay? So I'm not expecting you all to start doing the needling and the manipulation right from tomorrow, all right? Okay, dogs. Let's move forward. I don't know why this is not clicking. Oh, there we go. Tennis elbow, guys. All right. What do you know about tennis elbow? What is the tennis elbow thing? I'm going to clear your doubts. What is that? What is tennis elbow? But somebody says medial epicondylitis. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not a medial epicondylitis. Medial is golfer's elbow. Is it lateral epicondylitis or it is epicondylgia or epicondylopathy? It is no more. The evidence says it is no more an itis. I'm sorry. That's what we have been told. It is not any more epicondylitis. No, there is no inflammation. According to the Kareem Khan, who is a Canadian sports physician, he didn't see any white blood cells under the microscope when he was researching on the tennis elbow ECRB tendon inflammation. Okay, so it is not an itis anymore. It is we, the proper term we call for tennis elbow is lateral epicondylgia. So we don't use the word itis anymore. All right. So the myth could be, can you have seats, sir? Is that way? Are you okay? Yeah. So needling can hurt initially, but later on you feel good. So the tennis elbow, you need to palpate the lateral epicondyle. Okay. But the misconception is this is his lateral epicondyle right over there. You see the mark. We actually don't palpate the lateral epicondyle. Why? Because your common extensor region is actually one centimeter distal to your lateral epicondyle. So his common extension origin would be coming somewhere from here. Like so. See that? Nice tattoo. So this is the lateral epicondyle and the common extension origin comes a little more distal to, to the lateral epicondyle and that is the reason why sports physician and the people sometimes like to give that tennis elbow strap which is worn two centimeters below the lateral epicondyle all right so that is his common extensor origin okay you need to palpate for the radial head which is very common many people miss the radial head and believe me it is the radial head that actually creates the irritation of your supinator muscle over here it is a supinator muscle which actually creates more problem rather than the common extensor if you try to palpate the radial head and try to feel it on yourself, guys, supinate, pronate, supinate, pronate, supinate, pronate, palpate your radial head, 
palpate your radial head over there and come a little distal to the radial head believe me 90% of you all will be tense over there why because that is your supraspinatus hypotonicity that is your supraspinatus hypotonicity not your tennis elbow okay so radial head translation is very common which can lead to the supinator hypotonicity all right that's why it becomes important to palpate the radial head now you have done the assessment of the elbow but in the region of dependence you would also like to palpate and assess and manage the cervical spine thoracic spine and the ribs because the tennis elbow can also be coming from your third and fourth ribs or your cervical and thoracic spine that is called regional interdependence all right how do you do that now we can do some manipulation techniques for your radial nerve joint you can do some radial nerve flossing you can do some eccentric exercises and some proprioceptive how to manipulate your radial nerve joint i'm going to show you right now so can you stand sir thank you so the patient is in a standing position all right if you see i would like to palpate his radial head just 1 to 2 cm or inches distal to the lateral epicondyle wait let me palpate your radial head he's already hurting <laughs> let me palpate this sorry Yes, there we go. There we go. That's his radial head over there, under my thumb. So I'm going to do a proximal radio ulnar radial head manipulation. So I'm going to provide an interior force. Please stand straight, sir. All right. Make sure you never perform a hyperextension of the elbow. I'm going to put his wrist into complete flexion, like so, and I'm going to provide an interior direction force to the radial head. All right. so the patient is in a standing position i am standing behind the patient i am not going to extend the elbow my force is anteriorly on the radial head so please take a deep breath sir breathe out there we go all right you might hear a popping sound you might not most of the times you do but if not you can perform it the second time as well but not more than that all right i am providing the force with my thumb anteriorly okay i am not providing the force more here because you don't want to hyperextend the arm it can lead the injury to the supracondylar all right so please make sure you palpate the radial head properly and perform a radial head manipulation all right okay dogs dry needling for the tennis elbow you can do it on the extensor carpi radialis brevis or you can do it on the supinator as well now supinator is a little advanced technique where you have to palpate the radial head and the supinator muscle belly all right i want my patient to have a seat please sir you can take a chair i would like to use a smaller needle which is my 25 mm and believe me i will not go completely down with my needle all right so the patient is in a sitting position please come forward sir i can actually show it this way so if you can see his forearm that's a better view okay please relax sir and take a thumb pad okay so we don't have to really lean much so that is his lateral epicondyle and that is his common extensors okay that is his common extensors over here i'm going to always use a shorter needle for the common extensors i would like to palpate the irritable spot with my left hand where i'm wearing the glove please relax sir now he's quite slim and i will not go completely down in okay so that is his common extensors over there okay yep i can see that trigger point over there i would like to wipe it with my alcohol swab first so please sanitize and clear the area thank you i would like to take the needle and my gauge tube hold it like this hold it like this i am going i am not going to put this needle completely in because this is a 25 mm needle you can use a shorter needle but don't use a big needle the angle would be straight down in please relax sir i'm going to do it on his ecrb muscle in order to check the ecrb can you lift your middle finger sir well, lift your middle finger hold it up there hold it up there relax relax hold it up relax hold it up yep there we go and he had a trigger point right over there somewhere relax you can relax okay so i'm going to insert my needle right on to the extensor carpi radialis brevis okay now this is a 25 mm needle 
I am not going to put this completely in. I poke, I take it out. Okay. I'm going to bring the laptop a little closer. If you can see the needle standing right over there. I'm going to gently push the needle down. That's it. I'm going to gently push the needle down and I'm not going to put the complete needle down. I've already put at least 15 mm needle right over there. If you can see the needle, guys, I'm going to give a little bit of a, see that needle? See the needle? The angle is completely vertically down in the extensors. Extensor carpi radialis brevis. I can gently tap it a little bit. All right. And I have not put my 25 mm needle completely down. It is at least 15 mm needle uh, millimeter deep. Okay. Are you okay, sir? Good. He's happy. So you can put it for 30 seconds. You can put it for two minutes. You can put it for five to 10 minutes. All right. I'm going to take the needle out. If there is a, <coughs> if the patient has a chronic tennis elbow pain, what I can do is there's something called pistoning or fishing. I can change the angle. I can take it out. This might be a little uncomfortable to the patient. I can do something called pistoning. Now, see, that was painful for the patient. You can do some fishing and pistoning. This is called fishing and pistoning. All right. So I'm going to take the needle out. There's no bleeding as such. I'm going to press the area. Always press the area for the psychological relief. All right. Are you okay, sir? Good. Very sarcastic here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. I'm going to throw my needle in a sharp spin box. Okay. And that was a dry needling for extensor carpi radialis brevis. Now, I can do for the supinator as well, laterally from here, or using a bigger needle from here, because supinator is deep. But right now, because of the time and the expertise, I will let that needling go away. So you need to understand the referral patterns of these muscles. Okay. All right, I understand, guys, at the later part, I was a little quick. I was a little quick. So I really thank you all for attending this lecture. Okay, if you want to come to our dry needling hands-on course in Delhi and Mumbai next week in Mumbai and in the first week in June in Delhi, you're welcome to approach our team on the following numbers. You can note down the numbers. All right. So we covered the piriformis syndrome. Please understand the pelvis and the sacral dysfunction. All right. You want to learn about the dry needling advanced and basic hands on. Please look at the dates and you're welcome to approach on these numbers. You can email us or you can check our website. Electrical stimulation dry needling. I really don't do it because we think that the dry needling or the needles is not very specific to the muscle. I'll give you an example. The example is, suppose you want to treat a weak multifidi. Now, I approach the multifidi with my needle. And if you say that you want to stimulate that multifidi, but I'm also approaching the erectus spiny. Okay. So that's why I don't like to use electrical dry needling because it is not very specific. And the needles are just the conductance tool that you're using. I mean, you can use electrical stimulation or a Russian stimulation as well. So I personally don't like to use dry needling, electrical dry needling. All right. If you have any question and concerns, this was a lot of information, guys, for piriformis, tennis elbow and frozen shoulder. You're welcome to ask any questions on our WhatsApp or email. I would appreciate if you guys are interested in joining the extremity manipulated therapist certification course by myself, hands-on, and our US experts in Delhi and Mumbai, you can do that. Uh, or if you want pelvic health, which is a must for ladies, for the low back pain, uh, even the males, if they are having constipation, diarrhea, or any kind of a sexual dysfunction, you can do that as well, okay? So many people are asking me about the Bangalore. Yes, we will come to Bangalore, and we do plan to do these uh, hands-on trainings for the Bangalore as well. When it comes to the workshops, I really don't believe in the workshops. I believe in a holistic approach. That's why we also have a cohort manual therapy program, which is of one year coming uh, very soon. And our applications will be open in the month of June. 
Okay, so our manual therapy batch will be starting very soon. Soon, so if you want to register, you're welcome to uh, register for our manual therapy program. And all the dry kneeling, all the manipulation, everything will be covered in that cohort program. Acupuncture is is based on some tight, uh, some gallbladder or uh, certain points. Dry kneeling is basically purely on the myofascial trigger point. Okay. All right. I know people want me to organize these workshops in different parts of the country, in the different spot of the world. I'm getting the request. I really thank you all guys. It's been a long day for me. I appreciate you doing this on a Sunday or a weekend evening. Thank you for learning. Thank you for spending your time. Thank you for being patient. I hope to see you in my hands-on training in Delhi and Mumbai soon. So please register for pelvic health, dry kneeling certification course, and extremity manipulative therapists. All right. I'm Dr. Parijat Kumar, founder of International Sports and Orthopedic Manual Therapy. I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Take care.